God's love. Elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Hello there. I'm so glad you've tuned in because I think I'm going to help you today. And this whole week we'll be talking about the components of a vision. This is bound to be very, very helpful. Do you have a vision? Is it your own vision? And that's okay. Or or did, did God give you a vision? Did God speak something in your heart? Because God does speak through vision. You know, Abraham saw something and it changed the pursuit in his life. It changed the direction he was going. And Elisha saw something. Moses saw something. Uh, Jesus said, lift up your eyes and see something you currently don't see. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, it says that uh, one, of the, one of the things the Holy Spirit does is gives visions and dreams to people. Has that happened to you? Do you, do you know a vision from God? Now, what I'm talking and, and really hitting home this week, because I, I want to help you, is that a vision, every time God gave a vision, it has three components clearly detectable in it. Number one, a vision is seeing the need, seeing the problem. That's part of every vision. Now, now some people don't want that part. They say, oh, I don't want that part. I don't want to talk anything negative. I don't want to say anything negative. My friend, you cannot have a vision from God without being willing to look at the problem, see the situation as it is, not as you wish it were, or even not as you yourself are, but see the situation. I'm talking about our country. I'm talking about a local church. I'm talking about a business. I'm talking about education. I'm talking about your individual dream. See the need. God gave Nehemiah a huge vision to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But the very first thing he saw, he saw the need. He says that the the people are in distress. There's reproach on them. And and the gates are burned down and the walls are burned down. He, He saw the need. Jesus, when he shared vision with the disciples, he first described the need. He says, look at the people. They are weary. They are scattered. They are like, like sheep without a shepherd. We, we, he saw the need. He didn't just make some positive statement. You know, when, when Paul the apostle saw the vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us, that, that implied there's, there's a problem there. They need help. Somebody go go to them. There's a problem there. So every vision is seeing the need. That's very important. I I talk about that in the the teaching series on awakening. And you see that mentioned there. I hope you get the the whole teaching. Then the second component of a vision is seeing a solution. Because if all you look at is the need, you're going to become pretty discouraged unless there's a solution. God says, well, here's how it's going to work out. Nehemiah, when he saw the city in great distress and the people under great reproach, he said, this is a solution. He says to the king, send me. (laughs) That's often the solution. (laughs) Isaiah said that when he saw his people just beleaguered by so much negative stuff. He said, here am I, send me. Jesus gave a solution. The solution to the people being weary and and scattered and wounded is that the Lord of the harvest sent out workers. And and the apostle Paul, when he heard the cry from the Macedonian, man, come over and help us. He said, he he and his team, in fact, not just Paul, that they packed their bags and the next day they set sail for the place where the need was to bring the solution. Oh, you know, the solution is something very practical. So when you see a vision from God, you see the need, you see the solution, and then you see the end result. We need the end result because sometimes in the middle of working out the vision, the going gets tough. Sometimes you can be so overwhelmed with the complexity and the problems around you. Unless you have a clear picture of the end result, you'll just collapse under the weight of it all. 
And so, uh, you know, Nehemiah saw the, the end result. The city is going to be rebuilt. And, and Jesus saw the end result. Oh, he, he, he said, they're going to come to me and find rest for their souls. And the apostle Paul, oh, he saw the, he, he saw the end result that this gospel of the hope of God, it would be emblazoned across the whole world. And, and, and so you see the end result. You see a beautiful painting on the screen of your mind of what God has prepared for you. Wow, this is what I'm talking about this week. And if you missed the program yesterday, I'm sure it's there on our, on our internet site. You can, you can find it and look at that again. But I'm gonna go in now to a couple of segments of teaching from the service where I was teaching about this. So let's go to the first segment right now. And you always feel insufficient. It's like you're always in training. You know, this is typical of modern day legalism. When I look at the soup of Christianity is that you're never quite there. There's always something else. You know, you know God is working on something else in me. This just, well, well, he was doing that last year. Yeah, yeah, but there's more. See, there's always more. And you never, well, you know, you're almost ready to be released, but just, just, just a little bit more. It actually paralyzes us. I heard one preacher say uh, a few weeks ago, he said what we need in our church, not about our church, but about church in general, is we just need a little bit more faith and a little bit more love and a little bit more dedication and oh, God's going to move. See, that's the problem. It's always just a little bit more. You're never quite there. So no wonder we are very me-centered. No wonder, no wonder that the Facebook generation thrives in the church. It's all about me and my postings and my Instagram and me and mine. No wonder we have become spiritually impotent because we are constantly being fed this idea that we are not quite there yet. You're not, you know, you know, God's preparing us. Something great is going to happen. And our legalism today comes in this form. We must love God and love people. That's the, that's many churches. That's their slogan. Love God, love people. I mean, what's wrong with that? Nothing per se, except it's taken out of its context. The context is, beloved, let us know how much God has loved us. And so we will love one another. So just say love God and love people. It becomes a command. When have you loved God enough? Oh, you better try a little bit more. Oh, I think you fell short a little bit. What about loving people? Have you done enough? Have you prayed for everybody? Have we done everything? You never measure up. So we take it out of its context, which is, the love that God has shown to us is beyond anything ever revealed. And because of this love, discover this love, enjoy this love, walk in this love. And when you know this love, we love one another. We love because he first loved us. Yeah. So then there's this, I'm very concerned that the gospel isn't doing better in Toronto and Richmond Hill, and Mississauga, and Vancouver, and Calgary, and Halifax. It's not doing very good. Oh, churches can do good. You know, it's very easy to talk about church. People say, which church do you go to? How's your church? How's your pastor? Very rare do people say, how's your Jesus? No, 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 no. Jesus is like for Sunday morning when I put on my religion mask at 10.30 and, oh, I love you. You're everything to me. But after that, when that's over at 12.05, let's not bring Jesus into the stuff. Let's talk about your youth program and the kids program and your pastor and let's talk about this and let's talk about that. But let's not talk about Jesus. But our country wants to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus, but he couldn't. 
And so there are, the reason we talk so much about what the Bible says in the gospel of God's grace is because we're trying to bust a whole bunch of myths that, that we've dealt with, but they creep in. So can I give you some common myths that make us impotent, make us paralyzed? Can I give you just, I hope I cover three myths. We'll see if I can get through the three of them I have written down here. Are you ready? Myth number one. God looks for someone to stand in the gap. That's a myth. So don't say amen. It's a myth. God, you see what's going on, friends. God is looking for someone. Will you be the one? Will you be the one? Would somebody say, yes, I'll be the one to stand in the gap? Well, that's a, where do we get this from? Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. God says through Ezekiel, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in, gap, in the gap before me on behalf of the land, but I found none. But I found none. But we still go there. Oh, God is just looking for someone to stand in the gap. This is the cry of the Old Testament, but we're not living in the Old Testament. Goliath's cry was, give me a man. I want somebody I can fight with. Give me a man who is, who is strong enough. Give me somebody. And David came and he won a victory, but then he lost some after that. Not to Goliath, but other areas of life. So who is the man? Well, see, God has already sent a man and he found a man. It says in 1 Timothy 2.15, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So I want to say to you, myth debunked. God found a man to stand in the gap for the whole wide world. Look at it again. God found the man to stand in the gap for the whole world, Jesus Christ. So quit asking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap, but preach the man who stood in the gap. Lift up the man who stood in the gap. Because if we're still looking, oh, we need someone to stand in the gap, it's paralyzing. It makes us powerless. Oh, we're just waiting. No, we're not waiting. God already appointed his servant, Jesus Christ, and he stood in the gap. Are you getting it, my friend? Am I stepping on your toes? Am I killing a sacred religious cow here? You, you, you see, as long as we think that we have to stand in the gap for our country or that somebody else, if we're not willing, we're always going to be in this perpetual limbo. Well, is somebody standing in the gap? Am I standing in the gap enough yet? So we're always like waiting for something else to happen and we never quite get there. This is the curse of that damned legalism of religion that, that paralyzes us when the gospel has set us free and it says, go in this your might. Go, I'll never leave you, ne never forsake you. My friend, this liberates you. You don't have to wait for something else to happen. Jesus is the one, the only one. The man cries Jesus to stand in the gap. Oh, I, I get excited just by listening to myself here talking about this, but Whatever you do, get the whole four-hour teaching because it's, it's really four CDs along the same line, and some of them I won't be able to share anything on television at all. We only have so much time. You know, I, I can't just, we just have got to pick little nuggets here and there just to perk your interest and to bring some revelation. So get a hold of that. You see it on the screen right there. Awakening, why, who, when, where. Uh, get a hold of that. But right now, let's go back to another segment of this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll comment further. Let's go. Myth. Praise and worship brings God's presence. No. First of all, praise and worship is not the same thing as music. Music is music. 
and praise and worship is praise and worship. They're not at all the same. They're two separate things. Sometimes praise and worship can be expressed in music. Music can be an expression of praise to God who is glorious. But praise is not music. Praise is any expression that comes from the heart of a person who has discovered how great God is. So, for example, praise could be inviting your friend, your neighbor for a cup of coffee and sharing what God means to you. That would be praise. Praise could be helping someone. Praise could be giving an offering. Praise could just be giving somebody who looks really sad a smile and say, how are you doing? You're doing it because you have discovered God's love for you, God's compassion, God's kindness. So praise is praise. Worship is worship. And music is music. So let's get that very clear. That means praise comes in many forms. It's any expression. It could be, can I pray with you when somebody mentions a need? You are praising and worshiping God by saying, can I pray for you? Because you're saying, and maybe you go on to explain, you know, God is so good. God is so kind. He wants to help you. Can I pray with you in the name of Jesus? That's praise. Otherwise, if we think that praise and worship is only the style of music which we have invented in this come in the last, basically since the 1980s, then we pity all the Christians who lived before that. I guess they couldn't have God's presence. Now someone said, well, what about Jehoshaphat? You know, when he went to battle, he sent the praisers out first. That's right. That's right. But uh, that's not what that's not what happened when Philip went to Samaria. He just preached Jesus. That's not what the man did when he came down through the roof. He just had friends tear up the roof. That's not what blind Bartimaeus did. He just cried out, Jesus, help me. So we can't take one beloved instance from before Jesus is coming and his finished work and make that. Sometimes, absolutely, sometimes. What the Spirit of God will lead you to do is to begin to play music and worship and sing. But that's not a rule that that's how everything must be done any more than we make a rule that if you want to be healed, you must tear up the roof of our church first. And if you're lame and you're going to rise up and walk in our midst, you must make a hole in the roof with four friends. But sometimes maybe, hopefully that won't have to happen here because... Uh, we're glad that our roof has been fixed and is not leaking anymore, so don't get any ideas. I, I'm just saying, uh, we sometimes make something into something that it's not. And so, in fact, if you know what I taught last week, some forms of praise and worship doesn't at all make me realize God's presence. It's a turnoff. Songs where we boast about ourselves, which are so common, or where we rejoice in the demise of others, braggadociously. And so where do we get this idea that praise brings God's presence? Actually, we get it out of the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 22, 3, where Jesus, is the same psalm where Jesus feels alienated from the Father, and he says, you are holy, enthroned, or you live in, you dwell in the praises of Israel. Absolutely. Absolutely. When Israel praised God, God's presence was there. He lived in that. Absolutely. But he wasn't saying exclusively that's where he lived. Certainly when we praise God, God's presence is here. But he doesn't bring God's presence. Or let's look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. That's a good thing. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Don't, don't you know that? Unless indeed you are disqualified. You've, you've disqualified yourself. But I trust you will know that we're not disqualified. He's saying we who know that Jesus Christ is in us, we're not disqualified. But if you walk around thinking that Jesus Christ is not in you, you're disqualifying yourself. So this 
So, so does this say, well, you know, Jesus is only there manifest when you sing certain songs? No, it says he's in you. And he says, I could read many verses, probably over 100. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So do you see how this brings this impotence, this uncertainty, this feeling like we're never there? Have we praised enough? Have we worshiped enough? Do we have someone standing in the gap? Have we, have we done enough? Examine yourself. So I'm saying we are myth debunkers. There's many Christians living under a myth. Get them out of their mythology and into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's have an exodus out of the mythology religion into the gospel that is so rare and so precious. So I put a myth debunked. Examination shows that God's presence is in us through Jesus. Examination shows that God's presence is in us through Jesus Christ. I, I paused and I examined Peter Youngren. I tested Peter Youngren when he wasn't feeling anything and I came to the conclusion that Christ is in me, hence no more striving. I'm following through on this. A vision is seeing the problem, seeing the need. Number two, it's seeing a solution, a God-given solution. It is seeing the end result. I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the spiritual impotence of the church in our country. Even in churches where people are invited to receive Christ or in settings where people are invited to receive Christ, I think any pastor involved in that will agree with me. You'd be hard-pressed to not agree with this that the vast majority of people that respond to receive Christ in churches across our nation and certainly much of the world are people who were raised in church, have a mother and father who believed in Jesus or one parent or a grandparent or somebody and they may at one time have had faith in Christ but drifted away and we, we love it when they come back. We love it. We love it. That's beautiful. But the vast majority, and I'm speaking here in the Canadian context, but it's, it's, it could be true of another country, the vast majority of people in our country didn't have that kind of an upbringing. And when it comes to reaching people who have never been exposed to Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, we, we are woefully inadequate, it seems, to reach them. But actually, we're not woefully inadequate because actually we have Christ living in us and so we have all the ability to do it. But religion so clouds our thinking. That's why I've been teaching like I did yesterday and like I did today, showing these problems, sacramentalism, intellectualism, fundamentalism in its certain forms, modern legalism. I had this kind of contorted super radicalism that I talked about. All these isms are a problem I suggest we need to look at and then, and then say, what's God's solution? We, we, we cannot continue just so that when we hear a one church growing, if you study it, it's not because new people came to the Lord. It's because another church was in decline. And so, so maybe one church put on a little bit of better program and people came that way. No, you see, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So bear with me here. Don't turn me off. I, I got a message from the Lord. Get the whole teaching, awakening. Again, I, I encourage you. I rarely, I don't know when I, in such a way, just encourage to get teaching from me as I'm encouraging this. I'm going to ponder these thoughts and see how the Lord speaks to your heart and I'm going to pray with you before we're done, but first, watch this. Myanmar, where the population of 65 million is made up of over 100 ethnic groups. To many, the country is still known as Burma, named after the largest people group, the Bamar people. From 1962 until 2011, this Buddhist nation was ruled by a military junta, and during this time, Peter Youngren visited Burma in secret, training 200 pastors. Since the installation of a civilian government 
and the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, who spent many years as a political prisoner, there has been an easing of restrictions with new opportunities, including opportunities for the gospel. In 2016, Peter Youngren and World Impact Ministries returned to Burma in a great gospel festival. Peter and Taina visited the pagodas and met with many of the top Buddhist leaders from the numerous monasteries that dot the countryside. The response was beyond expectation as tens of thousands of precious Buddhists reached out to receive God's love through Jesus. There were many outstanding healings and some had visions of Jesus. This became a wonder to the people. Just like previous gospel festivals among Buddhists in Mongolia and Thailand, the gospel showed its power. Now the opportunity has come for Burma's second largest city, Mandalay, where 99.9% .9 of the people are Buddhists. With God's help and yours, this is the time to make gospel history. This trailblazing gospel outreach is only possible through the love and prayers and financial gifts of God's people. A big thank you to all who believe that the gospel is of supreme importance. Thank you for your prayers and your financial gifts. You are needed. Thank you. Please call now, 416-745-1820 to participate in this historical outreach or give online at peteryoungren.org. I could underline that with three red lines. You're needed, you're needed. And, and we are accelerating right now. I'm taking on more campaigns than I have for the last couple of years. But you know, these, these things don't happen by themselves, especially in these areas where there's so little gospel light. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. Call right now, uh, you can, or you can go online to give. That's of course, I think everybody knows now, it's, pretty, it's, it's a secure way you give through PayPal or some other means on our site. It's very secure, or you can call. Thank you so much. I wanna pray right now. We've been talking about our country, but the beauty of Jesus is that while he's concerned about the whole world, he's got the whole world in his hand, but he's got you and me, brother, in his hand. So, Father, I thank you that even as we've been talking about these awesome things that you have for us, I thank you for healing and blessing and anointing on these prayer requests in the name of Jesus. We command sickness and pain and every evil force to be gone in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for prayer requests becoming praise reports. God bless you. Keep calling. You are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1, or P.O. Box 2108, Vista, California, 92085-2108. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.